Hey everyone, and welcome to the Grow Hemp series. Today, we'll be covering closet grow setups and show you how my first closet grow went. So this will be a little different from my typical setup guides because there are so many things to consider for a closet grow and my setup was as basic as it gets because I wasn't really planning on using it since I have my closet mainly for drying and I already have the grow tents. So I'll be covering some of the more advanced configurations that closet growers should consider for their setup before covering how I did my super basic closet conversion. So the pros of a closet grow is that a lot of the guesswork is done for you. The size, shape, and location of the closet grow is already decided by where the closet is located, and all you have to do is figure out the rest of the logistics. Due to the height of most closets, it's also easier to grow taller plants, and of course, since it's a closet, the grow space can easily be concealed. The cons though are depending on the closet's location, paint and flooring, it could be a lot harder and more expensive to set up and maintain when compared to other indoor options such as a grow tent. Also because it's built in, you can't move the plant around if needed. One way to solve most of these issues is to just install a grow tent into a closet but that also brings along some issues as well, such as being able to fit one in the closet space. And by fitting it in a closet, it could lower the accessibility of the grow tent. So if you're going with the closet grow route, there are three main things you'll need to tackle. The walls, flooring, and air circulation. Let's start with the walls. The walls of the closet, as well as the closet door, will both need to reflect light and be moisture proof. For most people, if you have flat white paint, that's enough to reflect light. However, for long-term use, flat paint absorbs moisture and can lead to peeling paint, or worse, mold and mildew. If you're only planning on growing once per year, this should be okay on the paint, but any more than that, and you'll need to either line the walls with something that repels moisture and reflects light, like mylar, or repaint the closet with uh, glossy white paint which is the cheaper option, or a flat white paint that's moisture resistant, which is the more expensive option. Typically, these will say something like bathroom grade or stain resistant paint. Now let's take a look at flooring. While also having the same issues of moisture causing mold and mildew in the floors, there is also the additional issue of possible water spills and messes. For those with carpet or hardwood, both of which do not handle moisture well, you'll need to cover the floor with a plastic lining. A six mil plastic sheet is easy to find everywhere and are thick enough to not tear easily. Although if you're worried about tearing or puncturing, you can always apply multiple layers. With laminate floors, you can get away with no flooring depending on how the laminate is installed. Typically, laminate is waterproof on the surface, but not on the edges and definitely not underneath. So if you're not going to cover the laminate floors, be more careful and clean up water spills fast. And of course, if you have finished concrete floors, then you should be safe without any floor covers. Now for the most simple or complex issue you'll face with the grow closet, the air circulation. For this guide, I'm not going to be covering any sort of closed grow environment or closed loop system because of how advanced they are. These systems basically require an airtight environment. Instead of circulating in fresh air, you have to install a carbon dioxide generator to satisfy the carbon dioxide intake of the plants. These systems are definitely for experienced and commercial growers only due to their cost and complexity. For the beginner setup, you'll just want a way to get fresh air into the closet. As long as the room the closet is connected to has fresh airflow throughout the day, this is as simple as keeping the closet door open when the lights are on, since that's when the plants need carbon dioxide the most for photosynthesis. And then you can close the closet doors when the lights are off to prevent outside light from affecting the light cycle. 
Of course, this gets much more efficient with an exhaust and intake fan. An exhaust fan positioned at the top of the closet door will remove hot air from the closet, which also passively brings in fresh air from the gaps of the closet doors. An intake fan positioned at the bottom of the closet will bring in fresh cool air and circulate it throughout the grow room. Notice that because the exhaust fan is doing double duty of both removing hot air at the top and introducing new air through the gaps, if you're only able to install one fan, be sure to make it the exhaust fan. Now if you want to either A, conceal the grow setup, or B, scrub the air so that there's no smell, then this is going to be a little more tricky. For concealed setups, the most common way to get air in and out is to cut a hole through the side or back of the closet, which ideally will lead to outside of the house, and then install vents to prevent bugs from getting in. Although you can always get creative and cut holes in your closet doors with the view of the hole blocked by something like a bookshelf or a desk. For scrubbing the air, you'll need to install an air carbon filter to the exhaust fan and you'll need ducking as well and then follow the same setup as you would installing a carbon filter in a grow tent. From my experience, as long as the exhaust fan is strong enough to constantly pull air from outside, you'll never have a problem with the smell, even with a closet setup that's not airtight, as the air will basically never escape the closet except through the exhaust fan after it's been scrubbed. So for my setup, I did the bare minimum for all three things. My interior walls had flat white paint, and I just left it as is. And since the back of my closet doors were brown, I just taped the mylar blanket to the back of it. For the flooring of the closet, I had laminate, and all I did was line the top with 50 gallon plastic bags. And to make sure I didn't spill any water, I used large plastic bins to house my potted plants. For the air circulation, I used a large cardboard box, cut it so that it fit the height of my closet, and then cut two holes in the top where I put in two small USB fans, both of which I used to exhaust the air. I put one fan inside of my closet just to blow on my plants, and that was it. Overall, the supplies were about $30 to convert the closet, and including an LED light, the closet conversion costed me about $110. But again, this setup is not sustainable for long-term use. Now, including a cost of a seed, grow supplies, and utilities, my overall costs were about $200 for everything. So this grow log is going to be a little different from my typical ones because I didn't start or end my grow in the closet. In fact, I wasn't planning on using my closet to grow anything at all. But as you'll see, a situation came up to try out the setup for a few weeks. So it all worked out. I'm starting with six seeds and a cup of water for 12 hours to help make sure that the seeds germinate. And then I finish it off in a paper towel for another 24 hours so that the seeds have some air to breathe but are still in a damp environment to maximize the germination rate. At this point, five of the six seeds have popped and we're showing roots. So I planted the five that were germinated into solo cups and placed the sixth seed in the fifth solo cup, just in case it was a slow starter. This turned out to be the case as after a few days, the sixth seed also sprouted, so I placed it in its own cup. I left the seedlings under a patio because of the hot summer temperatures. As you can see, one of the six seeds already looks sick from the start. So now I'm down to five plants. This showcases the biggest problem when starting with seeds, which is that sometimes you could do everything right, but have the rare bad seed, causing you a ton of headaches, since you'll think you did something wrong when you didn't. So I always recommend growing at least two seeds at a time, so you'll know instantly when a seed is bad. I moved the plants into the greenhouse, but the seedlings are not doing great due to a heat wave of high 90s. So I transplant them into pots a little bit early. 
so at least the roots would be more protected from the heat. I filled the pots with Perlite and Fox Farm Ocean Forest Potting Mix, which is a great organic soil. And because of this, I didn't have to include fertilizer when I watered the plants for pretty much the entire vegetative cycle. When transplanting, be sure to do it at least a day after watering so that the soil isn't stuck to the cup. Here, I'm supporting the plant and soil with one hand, and with the other, I give the cup a slight squeeze to separate the soil from the edges before giving it a tap on the back for the whole thing to loosen out of the cup. Also, be sure to always water the entire plant after you're done transplanting into the new pot so that the plant will start to bond with the new soil. Now that they're in their final pots, I have all the plants labeled, and today we'll be covering plants number 3 and 5. Also, because these were normal seeds, this would be my first time possibly getting male plants, which I wanted to try and grow to learn how to harvest pollen and uh, possibly make my own seeds. So as you can see here, although the average daytime temperatures here were in the 80s, each time I got a spike of hot weather, the heat would burn up a lot of the older leaves. The plant seemed to power through it though, as the new growth always looked green and healthy. I now pretty much just left the plants alone and would water every 3-4 to four days with just tap water. The Fox Farm soil seems to be doing a great job at feeding the plants naturally, so I don't have to worry about including a feed for the plants, which is nice. I forgot to note earlier, but when I had the plants in the solo cups, I used a normal soil mix since seeds don't need much fertilizer to start and could actually get nutrient burn early on if it is growing in something with fertilizers built in during the seedling stage. Also, normal soil is just way cheaper than using Fox Farm soil early on, so there's also that. At this point, there was a huge heat wave coming through with temperatures over 100 degrees for a week. And although I took a couple of precautions like lining the greenhouse with plastic and installing an exhaust fan, halfway through it looked like plants number 2, 3, and 5 were not going to make it. So I moved those three plants inside to grow in the closet. Before moving the plants in, to make sure I didn't bring any bugs inside, I rotated a combination of garden safe soap and oil based bug killers and deterrents every night on the leaves for a few nights, which worked pretty well as I didn't notice any bugs in my closet after moving them in. I needed to place the LED light at an equal height for all three plants, so I topped plant number 5 because it was way taller than the other plants. I started the plants on a 12 hour light cycle because they were already big enough as is, so I was ready to flower them to confirm the sex of the plants and then harvest accordingly. At this point, I finally started to add fertilizer into the water as some of the lower leaves are starting to yellow 
which indicates that there isn't enough fertilizer anymore in the organic soil. And after a while, all three plants have recovered nicely from the heat damage. Plants 3 and 5 are both starting to grow pollen sacs, which mean that they are male plants. And since I didn't want pollen all over my grow closet, I isolated them outside. I made a makeshift way to block the light to maintain the 12 hour light cycle outdoors. And after a few days, when the first pollen sac started to open, I tried my first attempt at harvesting pollen. I took a box and placed it under what looked to be mature pollen sacs and shook them a little. What I realized from this attempt was that while it was possible to harvest some pollen off the branches, you'll lose a lot of it just by shaking the branches because the sacs that are ready to open on the entire branch will do it all at once when you shake it. So whatever you don't catch is wasted. Because of this, I decided to try another common method to harvest the pollen, which was to cut the branches off of the plant, place it in a vase on a glass table, shine a grow light on it, and let the pollen sacs mature at its own pace. When they open, the pollen will fall on the glass table, making it easy to harvest. This worked like a charm, and as long as you keep the stems well hydrated, all the pollen sacs will mature and open over the course of a few days. As you can see from the video, the stems take up a lot of water, so you really have to be diligent on refilling the water in the vase. And that's it. 